Well, what's up, everybody? My name is Chris Mayer, and you're tuned in to Boston Indies Lightning Talks. That's right. It's not Bit Show. Bit Show will, will return one day, probably. I'm not making any commitments. Thanks again for joining us tonight. Uh, we had a couple of uh, technical issues. These things happen. What can you do? 20, well, not, not even 2020 problems anymore, right? 2021, going on two years. Very exciting. Uh, before we get started here, uh, let's just introduce ourselves. My name is Chris Mayer. I'm joined, of course, by my fellow Boston Indies board members. Uh, I'm Gavin. Unfortunately, my camera uh, doesn't seem to be updating there, but, you know, I, I'm here in spirit. Oh, yeah, that's weird. not hearing any of my audio yet no, let's see if this is I better think... now and you can actually hear that my name is ted atkinson uh all right i think that was good eh, either way we're gonna find out yeah i i checked the stream we're, you're we're good anyway you can follow boston indies on twitter at boston indies on facebook facebook.com slash boston indies and of course on meetup meetup.com slash boston game dev if you're not already in the boston game dev slack you can join that slack.bostongamedev.com come hang out come chit chat with all your favorite local game developers uh see what people are working on hang out uh talk about valheim or what music you're listening to this week whatever well we did a great whiskey tasting for uh, local devs last week that was just excellent uh, a lot of really interesting stuff uh, yeah. I know. Oh, sorry. I was going to pop in with the Master G events. Oh, yeah. Uh, so before we get started, just a couple quick announcements, starting with. Yeah. So Master G's got a few events going on. I know there's Game Challenge uh, next week on the 26th. Um, and they're also running a uh, game jam targeted at high schoolers called uh, Jumpstart Jam. Um, find out more info by going to their uh, Twitter page. What is that Twitter page? Uh, that is, I believe, Mass Digi. Just Mass add Mass Digi on Twitter. Is it Mass underscore Digi? It's one of the two. Anyway. Yeah, it's Mass uh, underscore Digi. There's also a link to Game Challenge on the Meetup page. Again, meetup.com slash Boston Game Dev. And uh, Boston Unity Group also has an event coming up on the 31st. And that's going to be the folks who make choreographer presenting about uh, gameplay, uh, adapting your music to fit. Uh, or, what is it? I didn't actually read the title. Make it cinematic, adapting gameplay to adaptive music. Had the word adaptive in there multiple times, and it really threw me off. Anyway, I think I think that does it for us. If anyone has announcements about other uh, cool stuff going on, drop them in the drop them in the chat. And uh, yeah, I think I think we're good to get started. I think so. Sounds, Sounds like, like a plan. plan. All, All right. right. Well, well, what we are going to do then is we are going to uh, bring up our first lightning talk then of the evening. Uh, and this is going to be about multi-scene workflow and unity for large teams. Uh, Mike Berto is going to come on and, uh, and give us uh, some info about that. So hang on, everybody. We're going to switch over and uh, enjoy the talk. You scared me. Yeah, I can hear you. What's up? Gotcha.
all set. All right, Coolio. So my name is Michael. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry. I can start, sorry. My name is Michael Berto. I'm a game designer and developer. And um, yeah, some people know me. I work with Jumbun Studio uh, on some projects. I've uh, led design and led uh, the programming front on those projects. So yeah, that's me. And this lighting talk, um, I'll be short and sweet with it. It is basically about preventing or not preventing, but easing uh, multi-discipline teams and working with Unity and using multi-scenes to approach that. So I'm gonna share my screen and cut right to the chase here. Um, screen two. You guys can see this? And then I'll just go present. Is this visible? Yes, no, maybe so. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's weird. Software does whatever it wants nowadays, I suppose. Cool. All right, ready to go. So multi-scene workflow in Unity. So I already did this, um, a Michael Jumbun Studio, the project I'm working on right now, I'm working with Google Stadia and Playcrafting on some game jam. And I know that the thing is, I said large teams, but I suppose that's subjective, but here I'm talking five to 10 because I haven't worked in a bigger team and wouldn't want to either, but I digress. So non-interruptive simultaneous iteration. So this picture right here is of your typical, well, some unity hierarchies, which is, you know, you can see here that like people have like a series of game objects and they'll have like some empty object as like a buffer here to like break up the scene so that when they see it, they know where the UI is, where the environment is and all that stuff. And that kind of breaks down when you're working with multidisciplinary teams, when you have someone that is working on the lighting independently, the gameplay independently, the cutscenes, the audio, and the environment. And the reason for that is in this one hierarchy right here, any change to it will dirty the scene. When you dirty the scene and two people, uh, when two people dirty the scene, you have merge conflicts. And I'm sure we've all dealt with merge conflicts in some capacity. And so this makes it very difficult because merging conflicts, especially in scenes, is a headache. So what are solutions to that? Obviously version control, just good merge tools. You can use prefabs or my favorite solution is just to not have merge conflicts at all. And so the prefab approach, which is I'm sure if people have used Unity, um, we're all familiar with prefabs. And basically one idea to mitigate the previous hierarchy is to break up each individual section into prefabs. So you might have like in a big composition, you may have a prefab that's just for environment a prefab that's just for lighting and so on and so forth, such that each individual discipline um, lead for that can uh, work on their respective prefabs. So it might look something like this. And I call the scene and solution because I've done this multiple times and it, it, it works kind of, but it breaks down very quickly. So why is that? So this was the approach that I was describing, but what happens is should your audio person or should your VFX artist or should your environment artist want to just shift anything in the prefab, any change that they do out here, I highlighted the hierarchy here. I wonder if I could, I'm not even going to zoom in to mess with the zoom, but any change to the prefab will end up dirtying. It will update the prefab, but it'll also dirty the scene because prefabs have to live, even though they're serialized onto disk, when you're editing them, they live in the scene. And so when you know, do you move the transform to the right? You can, you'll save the prefab, but then you'll also dirty the scene. And once you dirty the scene, we're back to square one of we're all working the same scene. And now we have a merge conflict because someone dirtied it. 
Now there is a solution to that and that's prefab isolation mode. Now in isolation mode, basically you double click on the prefab and it basically shows you all the game objects that live within that prefab. So all your editing and tweaking and all that stuff will happen uh, locally in the prefab and not edit it. So basically the scene is just looking at a mirror of the prefab and not looking directly at it. Now, my problem with that is two things. If we're talking about a group of multi multi-discipline people work on the same composition, the best scenario is that I don't have to go to a new section in my prefab isolation mode to see how my work blends in with other people. As in, if I'm, you know, someone's working on prop and someone's working on environment, I don't want to have to zoom in on my prefab in my props prefab, move my props independently, and then, you know, zoom back out of prefab mode and then I can see. You kind of want everything to be in front of it face value and just work that way. Also, like I just described, if you dirty the scene, if you edit the prefab, although you can save the prefab and you know save changes, if you're not careful and double clicking and making sure to edit in prefab mode, you will dirty the scene and then that's terrible. So this is a screenshot of uh, prefab mode. Now, I highlighted this because Unity recently added something that basically was a fix to my problem in prefab mode in which the problem of when you double click a prefab, you can only see the prefab and not the overall composition. So now they added prefab context in which when you do enter prefab mode, instead of you only seeing the prefab, you can also see everything that's around the prefab in the scene in which it lives. So you see here, the prefab is this um, environment right here with the you know, colliders and the skulls and stuff like that. And I added a little cube. That cube is not a part of the prefab, but I just added it on the outside. And that's just highlighting that like, the, 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 the value in this is that when your lighting person is editing their lighting prefab, they're not editing the lighting without seeing the rest of the overall composition. And that, that's cool. But there's still a problem with prefabs that I don't like, even though the context does solve that problem. Where's my next slide? So I'll get into why I still don't like the prefab, even with the context. But now I'm going to talk about the multi-scene workflow. So basically here you have um, one composition broken up into multiple sections. So you have your intro layout, intro lighting, props, and so on and so forth. And this is cool because one, I think it's more intuitive because now that we're in different scenes, there is no prefab double clicking and there's no chance that when I edit the prefab, I only meant to edit the prefab and not dirty the scene and you have that discrepancy here, that doesn't exist. When you just break up the scene straight up into layers, it's when I see a scene is dirty, I know what I have done and I know what I'm committing and pushing and that's as simple as that. And yeah, it's more intuitive than double clicking a prefab and doing that stuff. And here's just another, yeah, here's just another example of that. And I even broke it down super granular here in this project that I worked on. I had the UI person work in their own separate scene so they could just double click it. There was no bottleneck on me for instancing the prefab or doing anything like that. It was just, okay, that's your scene, just work there. Um, now this is also nicely because if you have the prefab approach, you could maybe like, you can bundle up your prefab and put a bunch of like a master prefab and then have like a bunch of children prefabs inside of that. And that's cool and all, but there's some overhead in that and instancing that all the time. And so I like the, the scene, the scene composition way, because here you have, you know, I made a custom tool in my project for things like this. So now instead of having all these prefabs that, you know, we have to group together and have them in the previous way, you can have layers. And that's really intuitive for people that maybe aren't familiar with Unity and trying to explain to them how to not mess up and dirty the right thing and stuff like that. This is way more intuitive. So here I have a bunch of scenes that I was describing in these clips but they're broken up here into scriptable objects. So, you know, you just tell whatever person that wants to work on their section, like here is all the scenes that make up our department composition or all our base scenes. And you just click it and load the layers, load them additively or single and or however you may desire. And another thing with scene layering is kind of what I was alluding to earlier was that when you do that big prefab approach, when you destroy that prefab or when you load it singly, um, every time you load a scene single um, by single, it calls resource.unload assets, which invokes the garbage collector immediately. And that is going to be a mess too if you just keep loading scenes single and single. But when you load scenes additively like this, it's up to you when to call resource.unload. And so that makes level streaming very easy if you want to do that. And yeah, um, that's it. And the only limitation, which is actually, I think, a good limitation, is that when you have um, multi scenes, you can't. Uh, 
reference an object from another scene. So basically you can like drag and drop like a, a transform reference into a component that are in two separate scenes. And some people think that's a caveat, like a limitation that's negative, but I think it's good because if you could do that, then you're introducing dependency between scenes and then we're back to square one with merge conflicts. And so, yeah, that's it. I hope I didn't go over. No problem. You can hear me, right? Great. Sure. Yes. Perfect. Sure. So I'm going to share my screen. That's all right. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, my name is Ezra Cove. I am a 3D artist, uh, professor of game art at Becker, Becker College. Uh, I've been uh, doing game art for about 11 years. Um, I uh, have mostly do character art and prop art, but I, I've done some environment art and recently have been diving into Houdini. Uh, so today I'd like to show a little bit about the essence of Houdini. Um, how it thinks and how it can fit into the game modeling pipeline. Uh, very quickly, Houdini is really just another 3D package like Maya, Blender, etc. You can do all the same kinds of stuff, <clears throat> modeling, UVs, rigging, animation, effects. It's actually been along for, around for a long time, uh, widely used for film, especially for visual effects, but not nearly as much for games yet. Uh, in my opinion, its greatest strength right now is in-game dev is for uh, procedural modeling, which is, uh, you know, I'll show a bit about today. Uh, I should add that uh, I think in the last week or two, SideFX uh, announced that their engine or plugin portion of Houdini is now free, which I'm going to think is going to lead to more indies adopting it. So that being said, let's dive in. Uh, hopefully you all can see uh, this is Houdini. And what I'm really going to quickly do is just uh, show again a little bit about how things uh, you can see we've got the 3D viewport, and we've got this uh, kind of very important network view over here. So I can just start laying down stuff, and what I'm going to do is put down this geometry. It's just a container, a geometry node. So this is a whole node-based program, non-destructive and all that stuff. And uh, I'm going to just dive right inside there and start putting stuff in there. So I'm going to start with a null. Pop that over here. Kind of like uh, switching up things like colors and shapes over here. And what I'm going to do with this null is it's really just going to be a uh, sort of holder for parameters. Uh, so I can create parameters. Uh, let me just actually just lay down a box too for a moment. You'll notice if I lay down something else like this cube, this box, it's already got a bunch of preset parameters. But over here, uh, what I'm going to do is start customizing to uh, create, in this case, just one parameter. I'm going to start editing this. I'm going to really quickly just hide these two. And then I'm going to go ahead and create, you can see I've got this nice long list of parameters available, uh, numeric values, menus, all kinds of stuff. I'm going to just start with a little float. Pop that right over here. Uh, I'm just going to give the thing a label of value and I'm going to give it a range of one to 10. I'm going to really quickly just have a starting value of one and then apply. And you can see over here, 
sure enough, I've got this new custom parameter called value that just simply slides from one to 10, doesn't do anything yet. Uh, where the magic starts to happen is that you can start to have this parameter or other parameters drive yet other parameters. Uh, so the idea here is I'm going to have this one slider control multiple things. And I should hasten to add that all this stuff is going to again cascade down to um, say a game engine like uh, Unreal or Unity. So real quickly, I can see my time wasting. I'm going to, um, oops, jump back over here, pin this down, go over here. I'm going to have the, um, I'm going to start uh, having one parameter drive another one. So I can just go over here, try it one more time, copy that parameter, go down here, paste relative reference. And you can see what this does is now, when I start to increase this value, it's changing the center or pivot point. What I'm gonna do here though is just divide this by two. So now it stays rooted down at the ground, okay? So next up, I'm gonna take this custom parameter and I'm gonna have it drive the Y scale. Page relative reference. So now you can see this master slider is controlling that, okay? So I'm gonna go further. I'm gonna add in a second box, make that visible. I'm gonna really quickly change this size to say 1.2, 1.1, 1 1.2. So I've got a sort of flat box there. I'm going to move it up so it's sitting right on top of the other box. And I'm gonna go ahead and merge them so it's all kind of one unit. There we go. So you can see I've got one box on top of the other. Right now the Custom parameter up there is only controlling that one box now, but I'm going to have it do some additional stuff. What I'm going to do here is just pop in a little copy and transform node. This is just an array here for making multiples uh, and transforming them. And I can again say, I'm going to take this value right here and I'm going to have it control the number of copies. So again, copy that parameter, go over here, paste relative reference. Uh, and right now it's just gonna duplicate them all on the same spot. So then I can go over here to say this translate Y and make sure that they go upwards. So now you can see the same value is driving not only the scale of the initial cube, but it's also increasing the number of these little cubes over there. Uh, I can see that my time is really getting tight. Uh, let me just see if I can quickly do a little extra business before moving on. Maybe I'll just have this also drive the scale over here. So I'm gonna go down here to the scale of these things. Really quickly, I'm gonna copy the parameter right here, paste relative reference right here. So that's controlling that. And I'm gonna again take this thing, copy that parameter, and then have that drive the X scale, paste relative reference, and then it's going to be pretty dramatic right now because each one is two, two times the scale of the previous one, uh, or sorry, it's exponential more than two, two times. And I can just do a little math, for instance, I can say something like um, one plus here, then oops, missed that little thing. Add in the parentheses, oops, over here, I can say like I divided by 100. Let's see if I've got that right. So now, we're getting an ever so slight increase just by sort of decreasing that a little bit. Now, if I want to also see how I've got this funny thing where it's sort of, um, I'm gonna skip this because I wanted to show some other stuff. Let me open up a pre-made thing that I just created just so you can get a sense of some other kinds of things you can do over here. Uh, so again, I've got a null over here that's controlling everything. I've got a couple of sliders just a little tower here. You can see the first slider is actually an integer instead of a float. That's that's why, you know, it's just good for whole floors, for instance. So I've just got a five floor maximum right there. I've also got another slider that can interactively increase or decrease the size of the windows. And I also created a little roof swap. So if you wanna have one to a hundred different roof types, you can really quickly change it with a little menu. I can go to say normal to a panic peat top. And I can even have this little thing where the panic peat can morph into a different kind of like popped out version of yourself. So hopefully gives that gives that idea. The last thing I wanted to show was uh, just a pre-made, another asset. Uh, let me find Unity if I can, there it is. Uh, just a little fence that I created. Um, and just to give you another idea of um, how you can manipulate stuff and set them up, I've uh, generated this fence based off of a curve in Houdini. 
And then what I did was when I exported it, and you can export a little file called an HDA file, Houdini Digital, App, Digital Asset, uh, which again can just be uh, imported into uh, Unity or Unreal. Um, then I can just edit this curve and start to get some nice fence variations. So for instance, I could just start editing these existing points. And you can see the way this is set up is it's not um, scaling this. You can see it's uh, set up in a way that it just adds the correct number of pickets in between. Go over here and edit the other one if you like. Uh, in addition, I can add extra points to interactively fence this whole space in. And then finally, I have some parameters over there that I had set up. I can increase the height of these. I can change the picket type, slightly different. And I can increase the number of rails. And uh, yeah, that's what I had to show. My pleasure. Hopefully now people can actually hear me uh, out on the Twitch. Still here, still plaid, uh, and uh, now uh, plus one beer, uh, thanks to technical difficulties. <clears throat> so we will continue on with our program here. Uh, uh, let's see, next up we have our uh, good friend, Andrew Bailey, who's going to talk to everybody about the indie apocalypse and collective small press publishing in games. Uh, let me see if we can swap over here. And thank you again all for uh, hanging out with us, even if you did miss my very, very exciting uh, jokes last time while I was muted. I promise they were great. They could never be recaptured. I'm very sorry for all of you for that. Uh, Andrew, hopefully you can hear me. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, fantastic. Let Do I hit start video on my thing? Sure you just, should. Is that how you see my camera? Here we go. I have a camera now. That's the one. You are live, sir. Oh, perfect. Hello. I'm Andrew, as the name says. I started this magazine thing about 14 months ago called Indie Apocalypse which is a self-published small press kind of like game zine. Think of it as like humble, but if it was like with nobody you heard of. And the idea behind this is that it takes a long time to make a game. And I thought like, what if it didn't take, what if, um, you know, people didn't have to spend so long making a game and what if there was like a way to grain to kind of like get value and create like more, um, you know, Oh, Oh, that's fine. <laughs> it's, okay. Perfect. Okay. So, yeah. So it's, it's a way to bring like more attention to uh, like smaller games by doing like what the artistic model has always done, which is collective publishing, which is just, you know, take a lot of people you don't know, put them all together and say, Hey, here's a singular anthology. Here's a thing that you can get and use as a way to bring everybody together up oh, here. I'm back. Um, yeah. So these are 14. I'm gone again, but these are 14 things. Um, kind of cycling through this 10 games per issue. And each issue is just kind of like, Hey, here's the breadth of what indie games can be whether they be tabletop, whether they be digital, whether they be like ROM hacks or modern student demos and that kind of thing. And it's about like collecting people from all around the world because I think the, the three to five year grind, whether it's alone or whether it's a team is, I find it exhausting and it's certainly not for me. So I decided to try and make something that I didn't have to do that with. And Indie Apocalypse is kind of like the end result of that. In the middle there is, they all have covers because I like the idea of a zine aesthetic. So the idea was to make it like not just a bundle, but really lean into the zine aesthetic. 
and have each comes with a PDF zine that sometimes has comics, sometimes has individual smaller games within it. Some and it has a page for each developer to like um, like a big kind of like a poster for their game, if you will, within the zine itself. Where in a world where there are physical events, people can flip through it and check it out. Yes, and the uh, the very first issue of this was specifically all developers in the you know the greater Massachusetts area in the grand idea that they would be thieved each time and that lasted one issue but <laughs> that first issue was all made in Massachusetts developers debuted at PAX East when everyone was still wondering what was going on with that kind of thing and then now here we are 14 months later each other, each subsequent 13 issues has been locked down, but it's been something that I think is good because it helps to create a larger digital community to some extent, because here are all developers, mostly like people who don't know, not very rarely people know each other or very rarely do people know who anyone else is. So I think it's nice, a, a, like a nice way to like, oh, even if my 10 friends you know, don't come to check out my game. I'm bringing my 10 friends to nine other people. And then they are all, those other nine people are theoretically bringing their 10 other friends. So even if it's just like a small audience that comes to each issue, it's a small, like it's a expansion of like getting people's names out there and getting people's like work out there. Because a lot of people I think are doing just like fascinating work every single day and they're putting up on itch or their own websites or like anywhere really like the pico eight cart wherever they they're like a little cart warehouse that they keep everything on and there's just not enough time for everyone to find any of it all of it and all gets i believe constantly looked over so i think it's important to like constantly highlight work and that's what this is trying to do and it's also trying to uh, preserve it to some extent because i think it's very easy that it like and i think you hear sometimes that if your game is unsuccessful to like well maybe the switch port will be successful or maybe i will move on to the next game when i think it's just like this is a little not too much harm in like sticking by things for a little bit longer and trying new avenues and i'm trying to hopefully something like this will help create like newer audiences or like an audience that looks backwards more and because i mean there's so many games that exist i mean if you never played a game that came out in 2021 all year you would not be want for games there's just so many of them and th this is kind of like uh but like from the practical standpoint were you to say for instance do it yourself um it's there's a number of different ways to do it um the easiest way is actually just to collect things in like a bundle and put it up on itch um, they've done that in Michigan with the locally sourced bundle, which is just, hey, I put 11 games from Michigan developers and we put them in a bundle and they do that like every three or four months. There's similar bundles that have come out and that's like the fastest way to do this. I do this in the most roundabout way possible, which is I pay everyone individually and I create store pages and I do all that work myself because I want to make codes and I want to be able to import it to other like storefronts should they eventually accept me one day. But it's very easy to just like collect a bunch of, of your friends and say like, hey, here's our student games we did for the year. Let's make a student like a, our college bundle and just throw it up on itch. And I think everyone should do that kind of stuff more often. I think people should like work together where they can. And if you have some, the, the very loosest of themes to take those themes and put them together and say, hey, we did a global game jam. And then some of us want to say, here is the global game jam, like MIT location. Here's our like global game jam bundle. And just as like, even if, you know, it's pay what you want still, it's still like a way to, you know, get all of these, get attention to all of these games where maybe they would have otherwise like not gotten attention by like scattered individually, or maybe one would be found and the person who liked those one would love like love like six others of them, but would not have found them because finding things on the vastness of the internet is hard if you don't have a strong base to start off with and people already looking at your stuff. So 
I think collective publishing is good. I think everyone should try it. And also I think people need to get paid. And this is partially my way of saying games should cost more money and people should pay for your work. And if a game is five minutes long, that doesn't mean it should be free. Plenty of things are a lot more expensive in terms of our time value. Um, buy games, submit your game to IndiePocalypse. If you make games, IndiePocalypse.com slash submit. Thank you. That is my talk about, I think everyone should buy, play more games. Thank you. Definitely a subject I think we can all agree on. Uh, everybody <laughs> should play more games. Uh, uh, that's it. That's that's definitely the entire purpose of everybody coming out here tonight. Everybody buy and play more games. Uh, all right. Thank you, though. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, still here, still plaid, hopefully working out the technical issues. Uh, and the next folks who are going to come up and give a talk to us tonight are going to be Becca Malcolm and Rafael Torres, who are going to talk about fostering a game dev community in college when no one knows what's going on. And... Wow, yeah, that uh, that one definitely resonates with me. So I can definitely uh, say that that is something which will be very interesting to hear about. Let's see if we can swap them in here and get them right. up. Uh, Rafa, you got the screen share? Yeah. Give me one moment. Hey, all right. Um, it should be working. Yeah, uh, I think we've got you there. Hopefully everybody can see it and uh, please take it away. All right, yeah, um, this is our talk. I'm Becca, I'm the social chair for the Game Dev Club. And I'm Rafael Ares Torres, um, the treasurer for the Game Dev Club at Northeastern. And we kind of just wanted to give this talk about what it was like trying to run the club in 2020 when the world caught fire. So we want to talk a little bit about what kinds of things our club did when in-person club activities are possible, essentially pre-COVID. Um, our club meetings had a lot of really cool hands-on design exercises. And the one that I remember the most vividly would have to be when we were asked to modify a physical game board like Candyland, Life, and even Monopoly. The best part of the exercise was getting to see how the game dev community at Northeastern worked together and seeing how the brainstorm process worked really had me excited for the kinds of people I would meet here. I especially liked the meetings because I was able to meet new friends and really bond over our same video game interests. Something else that we did as a part of the club was a whole different workshop series. Um, every Saturday at the Northeastern Game Lab, which is equipped with computers and software necessary to make games and where students are taught hard skills during these workshops. Uh, before the pandemic hit, uh, we were in contact with a professor that had worked at Epic Games and was willing to teach students how to use Unreal as our, as our game dev curriculum focuses on Unity solely. But it sadly had to be canceled as COVID hit right before we could begin. Yeah, uh, another thing we kind of used to do when clubs were still in person, because everything else was still in person, is we would do like group carpools, the different meetups, we would arrange to like go to Boston Festival of Indie Games together. And that's really where we kind of pulled from our speaker pool. Well, we had mostly Boston local speakers come into our club and the, like the actual speakers were really informal back and forth discussions. And then kind of like right around the time uh, before COVID at like December, January period, we were actually starting to be more active with other departments on campus as well. Uh, the College of Computer Science had reached out to us and said they wanted to work with us more about career growth for the game dev program. So we were actually in a period where the club was becoming bigger and growing more right when March hit. And continuing what Becca was saying about growth, Northeastern reached out to many other Boston schools such as Becker College and Emerson for collaborations in the form of student beginner focus jams in an effort to create connections between these schools as these schools also had game dev communities within them. Our most successful game jam was the Global Game Jam and Kim and Jamie will talk more about that in their talk in just a few minutes. Yeah, so now it is March and everyone on the NU subreddit is going crazy because schools are closing. At this point, Northeastern administration had told everyone, everyone at the same time too, they didn't like tell club leaders first and then 
It told everybody that all classes had been moved online and they didn't really say what was happening with clubs, what was going on. We had no idea if we were allowed to meet, what was gonna happen for the summer semester, the next fall semester. And we were kind of busy worried about whether or not we had housing. So we weren't really thinking about it. I remember the day that Northeastern kicked us off campus, they told everybody to vacate Boston. Um, it was like a weekend, everybody was scrambling, trying to get storage and transportation. And I remember sitting in the living room with boxes piled around me and thinking, oh crap, we have to tell people that there aren't gonna be club meetings this week because we have no idea how to run that. We're not even set up for that yet. Um, and so I sent like this really quick message in our Discord saying, hey, we'll, we'll send you an update when we have them, but right now club is canceled indefinitely. And um, I lied to them because we never actually have an update to give because we never got any information from Northeastern about how clubs were expected to run over the summer when it was all virtual. We were kind of just ended our semester there. Um, <laughs> just got like canceled for the last month. A big thing on our minds, uh, the summer going into the, the school year specifically, um, was how we were going to adapt our existing format of the club to fit a virtual setting. Northeastern had only let the entire student body know about their NUFLEX hybrid format a few weeks prior to brainstorming. So it meant we would be somewhat on campus but really no information about how we should be running clubs, club meetings. Our classes were virtual. So for planning, we had to make the assumption that these meetings uh, were going to be virtual. So that meant thinking about how hosting workshops was going to work virtually um, and how we weren't gonna have accessibility to the game lab anymore. And personal computers sometimes can't run the necessary software for some workshops. As all this brainstorming is happening within our club, August rolls around and Northeastern finally decides to let us and the other 400 clubs know at the same time, some new information on how clubs should run. They let us know that clubs in fact should not expect any meetings in person. So everything should be online. And the most chaotic news was that the club fair where most of our new members were gained from was no longer happening. Now in our minds, all of us on the e-board are thinking how will we be able to get new engagement for the club as a primary source of new members was from this fair. As that is happening, Northeastern decides to change club portals. So our current mailing list of members, a part of the club is no longer working and the club website keeps crashing whenever you try to make changes to it. And the icing on the cake was Northeastern finally letting us know of ways they wish to garner club attention virtually but with very strict deadlines of one week notices to save spots for these events. August was very chaotic for all of us, so we got it done. Yeah, so once we kind of were able to calm down, think things through and really consider how we are going to handle a virtual format, we kind of realized what being online could actually do for us instead of just adapting to that scenario. So one thing is that we had always been limited in our club times by the physical spaces we could reserve on campus. Now that we were virtual, we had to use Zoom and we could choose a club time that actually worked for our membership rather than making their hours. So as a result, we actually got much better attendance when we moved online. And because we were able to record meetings and workshops through Zoom, people who didn't come could still get that content. Um, we, the design exercises were pretty easy to transition. Um, we used Zoom's breakout features. So that was kind of the same as simulating people wandering off into groups and corners of the room and then coming back to present. Speakers were a little bit different. Um, we kind of developed a more formal format for that where people would come in with like a deck and give a full presentation before we did like a moderated q a sometimes it was a bit harder to get people to break the ice online um definitely had to ask a lot more questions before it would come in the chat uh and in order to give our meetings that more like personal feel whereas like instead of like, like people come into the classroom early and hang around before the meeting started or they would hang out in the hallway afterwards to chat. We started doing check-ins during the meeting where we just take a few minutes and say, hey, does anybody wanna talk 
talk about how their week's been. Does anybody want to talk about their courses or their projects that they're working on and just kind of give it that more intimate feeling and personal connection? So what also helped with socialization was using the Discord. We had used Discord as like our social and communication platform online before the pandemic, but over the summer and into fall, it kind of exploded. We added a bunch of new channels for focusing on specific skills, focusing on development, some off-topic channels for people to like laugh about what games they're playing and shit post, stuff like that. I don't know, I don't swear. <laughs> and uh, we started doing like bi-weekly and monthly challenges for art, design, and writing. Uh, so people would actually be creating things. Sometimes it's kind of hard to motivate yourself to make stuff when you're just sitting by yourself on a video call. And lastly, inviting a bunch of other schools and um, local developers into the club's Discord. So we actually got a much more mixed membership pool and a lot more interaction with people through our club Discord, where beforehand it was like mostly just our current students and a few alums. Um, now we had students from other schools. We had former alums and people who were in the game development area coming to our club meetings. And so that was really cool that kind of like our, we were able to mix disciplines like that. So like Northeastern tends to be very heavy on, like the Northeastern community tends to be very heavy on programming and art to a small, like art, like design and art to a small extent. And like, I think we had like one audio person for several years. So it was really cool to get that mixing coming in. And we're hoping some of these changes remain even after we go back to being in person, like keeping that Discord really active, um, keeping check-ins as part of a meeting and recording things. So that's about where we're at with the online transition. Thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing with us. That was <laughs> awesome. It's, uh, it's definitely a challenging time right now. So. Uh... Nice to have folks getting a chance to do something new and exciting. Yeah. All righty. Let us uh, see about our next presentation here. Uh, we're going to switch over to doing a, a lightning talk by Shane Smith. It's about how Swap's main mechanic of uh, moving between perspectives works. Uh, so let's see if we can get that going here. Oops, helps when I actually, yeah, that's better. Hey, there you are. Hey, hello there. Have at it. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Shane. I am the dev for Swap, a perspective bending puzzle game about swapping between 2D to 3D perspectives. Uh, I've been working on this in my spare time for about two years now, and I'd like to take some time today to show you guys how my game's main mechanic works, uh, both functionally and aesthetically. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen here and quickly give you a demo of how the game works. Can you guys see that? Is that coming we, through? We had you for a second. Let me see if I can... Whoa. Uh no, no. It's uh, The problem is that sometimes... It does not like when we change between full screen and not full screen. So hold on. Not a problem. That might do it. And yes. All right. I'm checking the stream. I see it. All right. So as you can see, this is uh, a level that I've been working on for a little while now. Uh, this is just a top-down game. As you can see, there is a door, but this key is just outside of my grasp. But if I hit the space bar here, I have the ability to crunch everything down to a 2D perspective, and that key is accessible to me now. So that is, in a nutshell, how the whole game works. You can see that there is another key here, but I cannot access it. But if I hit space, you can see that there are several other platforms that I can swap to and fro from. And that is basically how the game works. Uh, so I have a couple of different levels that take this concept and kind of turn it on a couple of different 
uh, well, no pun intended, a couple of different perspectives here. I'll see if I can share my other instance of this game, just because I have another level up and running here. Do you see this? Uh, looks like it is coming up. Perfect. Yes. Uh, so uh, here is uh, kind of the same thing. You can swap between 2D and 3D perspective, only now it is a side scroller level. Uh, and as you can see, you can only go left or right. You cannot walk forward in this particular level. Uh, and as you can see, you can most of the time only walk on green unless whoop, you are walking on it in 3D. So uh, that's just another example of how the uh, swapping mechanic can work both in a top-down uh, environment as well as a 2D environment. Uh, and I'll take, uh, pull the curtain back a little bit and I'll show you guys how it looks in the editor. Uh, cause when I showed this to, uh, folks at the, I, I'm trying to remember the, the name of the, uh, festival where it was all online, uh, hosted by Boston Indies, I believe. <clears throat> uh, but, uh, I had a lot of people inquire exactly how does this, this mechanic work? So uh, here it is in the editor. I, I turned the uh, window all the way out here because I'm just an animal like that. Uh, but also so you guys can get a better view of how the uh, game works while I'm editing it. Uh, so same level, same uh, swapping thing, all that good stuff. Uh, but if we kind of change camera angles here, you can kind of get an idea of what's going on. So when I have the game set <clears throat> set to 2D, uh, my character is just floating off the ground at a designated point uh, where it's it's high enough to be above any obstacles, uh, but still like about the same height as any of the doors that are that are here. Uh, you can see I also have it uh, when I like swap the arch changes here. Uh, that's just for like visual clarity because it's kind of hard to tell what the heck is what the heck this is uh, when you're in 2D with with the arch on top of the door like this. So I set up a script that I tag certain objects as 2D and certain objects as 3D. Uh, so they only show up in depending on the angle that you are at. And all I have here is just a ray cast. I have a couple of ray casts. I'll explain what the other four are. But one of these just says, OK, uh, wherever uh, the player, whenever the play ah, player presses space, uh, just teleport down to that particular spot. And now you're affected by gravity again. Whereas in 2D, you are not affected by gravity. Uh, now that's great and all, uh, but I found when I was first making this game, uh, I had a terrible problem where the player could just walk right over everything. Uh, and they could just kind of, here's a simulation of how that went. They could just kind of go off forever. Or if they were like in 3D, they could just walk right off. So. My, my original strategy was, oh, well, I guess I'll just uh, put invisible walls around every single like area here. But as I quickly realized, as the levels got bigger and bigger, I was like, oh, I, I'm about ready to stab someone. I can't do this. So what I did instead was uh, I have a couple of different ray casts uh, in the four different directions that the player can go, left, right, up, down. And that they basically say, okay, is there ground in like this direction, for example, to my, is there ground to my right? If there is, uh, keep walking. If there is not, the player can no longer walk in that direction. Uh, so that's how I saved myself a, a boatload of time uh, with like tedious uh, level editing and all that. Uh, I also, uh, because I, again, wanted to emphasize the difference in, uh, in the two perspectives of 2D and 3D, uh, I have the movement uh, for the player character be just a little bit different because if you've ever played like uh, an old 16-bit top-down game, the player moves in very like jerky start and stop motions like on a D-pad. Uh, whereas once like 3D games started going around, the player, the player characters had a bit more momentum to them. Uh, it doesn't really affect the gameplay like too meaningfully, but honestly, I feel like the game is better for having that that slight distinction to it. That's just a, a personal touch that I, I felt was important. Um, I'll also take this time uh, just to give an idea of what the, what the general art style is, because right now I have just the glorious default texture from Pro Builders here. Uh, let me see if I can find my hub world here. As you can see, I, I made a lot of levels and only some of them end up in the actual, here it is. 
All right, in the actual demo, which you can find on my itch page, which I will paste into the uh, Twitch chat in just a second. Uh, so this is a little bit closer, uh, at least to what my vision is. Uh, you can see the 2D perspective uh, has these like pixel art, uh, grass and trees and stuff. And when I hit space, uh, that all changes to these uh, these like, basic low poly like plants and trees and stuff like that uh so i really wanted to play with the idea of uh the difference the differences in uh the 2d and 3d world and the kind of impact it has both in terms of gameplay and uh how it affects the characters in the game uh which i will work more on in the in the coming months and i don't know possibly at this rate years who knows uh, but that is just a, oh dear, yeah. Yeah, look at that, yeah. All right, but that is just a quick rundown of uh, how Swap works, how I, just a very quick like whirlwind uh, demonstration of how Swap's main mechanic works. Uh, and that is just about all I have for you guys. If you wanna see these other levels, uh, again, you can uh, download this. I just uh, made the uh, build a little bit earlier today. Uh, so you guys are free to go through this. And I also have a uh, a page where you can kind of give some feedback. And I have a Twitter that uh, is also linked in the game, but you can find me at Shepat Smith. I will be likely updating this game uh, in the future. I try to do it like at least once a month. So uh, that is just about it. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, thank you for coming on and talking. Uh, we, uh, we appreciate getting to see cool stuff like that. And that looks cool. Like thank you. A lot of fun. Okay, so next up, uh, we're going to go to Elliot Smith, and uh, Elliot has been doing art in the area for, uh, well, you, you can decide if you want to tell people how many years or not, uh, but has done a lot of uh, a lot of great work in the past, uh, both the Boston Indies and some of the other groups that, that run out of the game space. Uh, let's see if we can get you up here on video. Hey, that looks... That looks like what we want. And bam, Elliot, uh, you should be good to go ahead and take it away, sir. Cool, uh, I'm gonna try to present. I don't know if this is something I should do. We're gonna um, find out, make it happen. I, yeah, I have to figure out how do you actually present now again? <laughs> I believe you press the present button. This is good. That looks like it worked. We're going to keep our fingers crossed. All right. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Elliot Mitchell, and um, I'm an artist developer. I'm the co-founder of Vermont Digital Arts and co-organizer and co-founder of the Boston Uni Group. And I also want to give a shout out to uh, Another Castle out in Western Mass, where it's a game, a group of game developers who co-work together when when we're not being quarantined. Um, but what I'm really here to talk about today is um, different render pipelines in Unity and some shader authoring options. So currently U Unity has the traditional built-in um, pipeline. It's also called the legacy and the standard. And then there's a scriptable render pipeline, which people have heard of more recently, um, maybe Unity 2018 and up. Um, and there's the universal render pipeline, URP, formerly known as the lightweight render pipeline, LWRP. There's HDRP, the high definition render pipeline, and there's the custom scriptable render pipeline. And shaders are not interchangeable between these pipelines. Um, so I'm gonna start with the built-in legacy pipeline. Um, I am use this on any, pretty much anything that's a pre-existing project for me. Um, so I'm gonna go over the pros and cons of these pipelines and then go over some tools real quick. Um, okay, so the legacy pipeline does work on all platforms. So it will work on an Android phone, iOS, so it will work on Xbox and VR, whatever. So it has that. Um, it's supported currently on every version of Unity. Um, there's an asterisk next to that. Uh, it's, you can code the shaders by hand if you want to, and there's tons of third-party assets that use it. The cons is it's slated to have support dropped by Unity. So this will not be 
supported in Unity at some point. I don't know if it's Unity 2021 or 22. They are planning on dropping support for this. Um, there's no access to Unity's cool shader graph and VFX graph, so you're still CPU bound. There's no volumetrics in it. Um, it's not performant as the other scriptable render pipelines. Um, so like if you're doing certain kinds of games, like for an Oculus Quest or something like that, you probably want to be using a different pipeline. Uh, and the post-processing stack is no longer being developed and it doesn't support the new one. Um, then we have the universal render pipeline. Um, this is a demo by Unity on here. Um, and this one is pretty performant, um, but it's also uh, lacks a lot of features. Um, it kind of holds you back a little bit in some ways. It does give you access to the shader graph and VFX graph which we'll talk about later. And, and so that means that you can put more of the burden on the GPU. Um, it supports custom render passes. It works on most platforms, not all. So like, and this depends on what version you're using. Um, there's still like gotchas on some emergent platforms, but it, it, it's more widely adopted. Um, and there, you can find a reasonable amount of third-party assets for this. Um, the cons is there's, there's some big ones for all the SRPs is that the API is a moving target always changing. It just came out of preview, but it's always changing. Um, just look on Twitter and you'll hear all about it. Um, the, the versions of the universal render pipeline are tightly coupled to Unity versions, and this goes with all SRP. So not every version of this works with every version of Unity. Porting legacy shaders can be horrible. Um, I recommend looking at Unite Copenhagen talk by Yomaz Kimaz on porting lightweight render pipeline shaders. Um, and again, I said it's the most limited of all the pipelines in my mind. Okay, now we have um, it's the high definition render pipeline. Um, so this is, in my, my opinion, the most robust rendering pipeline. You have access to the shader graph, the VFX graph, so you can take advantage of that GPU. Um, you can have volumetric lights and fog and density volumes looks really beautiful. Um, you can use custom render passes, which is something that a project I just worked on for Sundance leaned heavily on. Um, it works in VR asterisk, meaning not on a quest unless you're using a link cable, but if you have a beefy GPU, um, you can make filmic VR that looks like nothing else um, with HDRP. And there's a growing number of third-party assets. There's still not a lot. Um, it has some big cons to it. Again, um, API is a moving target. The versions of HDRP are tightly coupled with the Unity version. So if you update Unity, it updates HDRP, or you have to, and it can screw you up. Um, the, the defaults and all the settings are really complex, and you really need to take time to examine them. To, it's really easy to make it very unoptimized. Um, it's very difficult to make it optimized and look good. Um, porting shaders to HDRP is probably the worst experience you'll ever, ex you'll ever go through if you do shaders, um, and it's not officially supported on many platforms. I still love it. Um, then there's the custom SRP. Um, this is Battle Planet Judgment Day. Um, this was total custom scriptable render pipeline that was um, talked about at Unite Copenhagen 2019. Um, the pros about a custom scriptable render pipeline is it can be highly specific and highly optimized. So it can be tailored to a game specifically, like that game, that look, it can just rock and just run like nothing and it has none of the normal Unity overheads. Um, but again, API is a moving target. It's pretty complex to come up with these scriptable render pipelines if you're not familiar with how they work. Um, basically any support's all on you. Um, we're gonna come back to this chart at the end, but this is just like a matrix of the render pipelines and some of the um, options that I highlighted um, that we're gonna go over really quickly. Um, so to author shaders, for you have an IDE or a text editor. So again, like for a built-in, you'd be doing like um, CG program and um, you, you don't do that for um, use HLSO um, for uh, HDRP and, and other pipelines. So, so the, the pros is that you, you can, again, if you're typing in a text editor, you can make it super optimized and it can be authored outside of Unity. The cons is that uh, you have to have knowledge of shaders. Um, it can be cumbersome and time consuming for non-programmers, especially graphics programmers. And if you're dealing with the universal or HDR pipelines, it's, it can, it's gonna be incredibly painful. 
Um, an old school shout out to Shader Forge, which was one of the first nodal, it wasn't the first, but it was the best legacy node-based shader graph by Freya Homer. Um, I love this. I still use it in my current project that is a little bit of a legacy project. Um, and it works like I'm using it in Unity 5, 6 right now. And I also have them using it in Unity 2019. Um, and it, it's, it's, a good, it's a good program. Um, there's lots of nodes and functions. It actually has more than Shader Graph, um, more useful ones, and maybe that's changing. You can compile and read this into a text editor, and you can distribute it if someone doesn't have Shader Forge, or you can distribute it and have it be edited by the Shader Forge um, editor tool, and it's pretty well documented. The cons is it only works with the built-in render pipeline. It's no longer officially maintained. There still is a GitHub that's kind of maintained. Um, uh, again, I'm using the more updated and uh, the, the shaders it does generate and compile, they're pretty uh, verbose. I think they're not all that efficient um, in some ways. Um, then we have Unity's built-in shader graph and this is nodal based. This comes with Unity through the package manager, supports URP and HDRP. It's officially supported by Unity with, should be an asterisk there. Um, it's, you, you get it through the package manager. Uh, you used to be able to get it directly through the package manager, um, but now it's kind of bundled with the, with like which render pipeline you're, you're using. Um, again, it's node-based. It you can add custom nodes to it now before you couldn't. So you couldn't add your own code to a shader graph, but on more recent versions you can. And this can also author, author a shader specifically for VFX graph, which um, is their particle system, GPU particle system. Um, the cons is that it does not support built-in render pipeline. You can only edit it in the Unity ed uh, editor, these shaders. If you try to open it in text editor or as text or compile, it like crashes Unity. Um, you can't just like say, I want this shader to work on these different pipelines. It doesn't cross compile. You have to make new shaders for each. Um, it lacks a lot of useful nodes and functions that Shader Forge and the next shader tool I'm gonna show you have. It's very it's tied very closely to um, the Unity version you're using. And it's really difficult for all the Unity render pipelines to know what shader graph and what, like, what package you use with what version of Unity. It's not very clear ever. Um, now I'm gonna talk about Amplify Shader, which is actually my favorite of the nodal shaders. Um, so it's, it has built-in HDRP, URP support. Um, I think it's the most robust. There's tons of custom nodes and, and functions that are missing from Shader Graph. Um, there's lots of templates and custom nodes. You can add your own code. It makes post-processing uh, shaders. Um, you can open it in a text editor. You can like compile a shader and take the text out and like do whatever you want with it. Um, it doesn't make the FX graph shaders. Unity doesn't officially support it. These are the cons. The UI can be spammy. And the most annoying thing is um, sometimes there's like, if you switch between Mac and PC, it starts like turning on and off and unpacking packages that screws with Git and you don't wanna like ignore it, but that's my main problem with it right now. Um, and I only have a little bit of time left. So then my last tool I wanna talk about is Better Shaders. And this is very new. Um, this is by Jason Booth. Uh, and this is a really cool um, sort of like hybrid approach where uh, you're basically writing shaders similar to how you would write like a surface shader um, and graphics programmers, it's like the CG shaders or the surface shade, the old shaders. And this will automatically compile it into built-in URP and HDRP at the same time. Um, it's fucking amazing. Um, you can... In the editor, you can like make shaders as little sections and you can stack them. So you can have like layered shaders in the editor based on like little sub shaders sort of. Um, so you just write shaders, you can stack them and reuse them. Um, you can export the, the source code and distribute on the asset store. You can, you don't need any special tools. They just like read like normal shaders uh, in Unity, which is amazing. Uh, the cons is that you kind of need to know a little bit about shading, about writing shaders. Um, or you just watch Jason's tutorials and it's not widely supported on Unity versions yet because Jason just released it like a few weeks ago. And um, 
as time goes on, he'll support more. Um, there will be a, a Boston Unity Group talk on this soon uh, in May. So just to go over this, to, to wrap up here, um, my little matrix will make more sense now. So on the top, you have, uh, you know, like the built-in shader and it supports everything but shader graph. You have URP, which supports everything but shader forge. You have HDRP, which supports everything but shader forge and custom, as far as I know, really only supports text editor. So these are your options. I think my suggestion is that if you want to get deep in nodal shading graphs, nodal shader graphs, go with Amplify. If you like to write shaders um, and you want them to work across render pipelines, check out better shaders. Um, that's, I think, what I have. That's it. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Sure. Uh, and hopefully people who are, who are more interested can go to your Unity group talk. Thank you. Uh, all right. We've got just a couple more lightning talks here. Uh, so let's transition over to our next one. Um, this is going to be Jamie Camera and uh, Cam Perry talking about how to run global game jam in a pandemic. Uh, this year was uh, weird and wildly interesting because, you know, of, of course it was. Uh, so let's see if they can give us some, some insight into what that was like in this outstandingly difficult time. Yeah, can you see this? Uh, let me get you up here, and I think we should be able to momentarily. Okay. Uh, it is still, there we go, perfect. That's what we want. Okay, so we're all good? Yes, we are. Okay, awesome. So hello. I'm Cam and Jamie's sitting next to me, although you can't see us. And we're <laughs> going to be talking about how to run Global Game Jam during a global pandemic. Um, so first things first, we normally host, as the Game Dev Club, we normally host the uh, Northeastern site for Global Game Jam. Um, although this year it was just the Boston site because no one else made one. Um, and it's normally in person. We usually have a site on campus that anyone can come to if they sign up for it. However, this year with the pandemic, we had to switch to a fully virtual format. Um, this was something very different for us. Uh, we had to learn how to set up a Discord that was going to be fully active with 100 plus people and learn how to use Twitch properly to be able to um, stream the opening and closing ceremonies, which we'll talk a little more about in a second. Um, most difficult part was really just setting up that Discord, getting the information to people and um, <clears throat> learning how to man it. Um, we run our club's Discord, but it is far less formal than it, than the Global Game Jam Discord needed to be. Um, we needed to be like actually professionals. And since we're talking to people that like don't know us and we don't know, and we are the ones running things. So it was very difficult just to get that in the swing of things for that. Yeah, so as we said, our club has been hosting Global Game Jam for multiple year years. So we already had like some expectations established on that front. Um, first, we already had the space um, saved for us, which was the library. But of course, if you went to Global Game Jam 2020, you knew we were in a different space. So of course, finding any place you can stay for 24 hours straight is already like an incredibly tough task, much less having one that accommodates so many people. One of the most important parts of this planning was security since our campus is open and there would be so many valuables in one closed place. For our event, we also had to make sure this location was central enough so that people could have easy access to restrooms and food. As everyone probably knows, a lot of people take Global Game Jam very seriously to the point where they might neglect their health. So making sure they have easy opportunity to get essentials is incredibly important. Along with this, we also provided some food. For this, we established like an event right to know the amount of people about the amount of people who would be showing up, and we were able to get our club to pay for it as needed. So, if you ever see something that um, requires sign up by a certain date, um, this could almost definitely be why. Um, we also had some issues with our school Wi-Fi. Uh, so at points like the guest Wi-Fi just didn't work. That was something that we kind of didn't take to account, especially with a new um, a new location for us. And we ended up just like giving some people our personal school accounts, which like wasn't the best state thing, but it was the short term solution we basically had to do. Um, 
And honestly, like Wi-Fi is one of those things that's really hard to change on a major institution. And it was probably one of the harder things generally in a real life event that we have to plan for. So as we mentioned, like we have both an opening and closing closing ceremony. Um, so a great thing about the digital part of this is that we can account for seemingly unlimited amount of people. So this is like great, but also incredibly scary. We love to have as many people as possible par participating in the game jam, but now we knew that stuff like opening and closing ceremonies would be an issue. Our main platform, Discord, in case you didn't know, it only allows for a certain amount of people to be on a voice chat at once and even less amount of people if we are streaming video. Um, so to combat this, we decided to use a live Twitch stream. We were very kindly allowed to use the Boston Indies Twitch page, which again, thank you so much. It helped us out so much. We were expecting a decent amount of people. And at some point during the live showing, we did have over 100 simultaneous viewers, which was great. And I think this was a really amazing way to allow people to celebrate together. We took a similar approach during our closing ceremony. Typically, this would be where every team shows off their game trailer for a short amount of time and has the opportunity to talk a little bit about it. Um, to do this online, we had a deadline of about two hours out from the ceremony and had a Google Drive set up that everyone could submit to. Thankfully, since we were not on the same network this year, it was quite an easy process for the teams. We had them make a folder for their team, which included the team members and a small description and a game plan trailer. We would read the description for each team, then show the trailer. Remember, one of the biggest things that to remember about this is to always prepare for people submitting later than the deadline and to give some amount of grace period for that. And I think this worked really well because during our closing ceremonies in the past, um, because of like restrictions with how many people can come, it wasn't it wasn't guaranteed that like if someone wanted to bring a friend, they would be allowed to. But with this now you could share the link with anyone and it was a really great way to get um to just get like your friends and family to see what you've been working on and we actually ended up having higher numbers on the closing ceremony than the opening ceremony which i think just shows that people were utilizing that um and yeah overall it was a really great transformation i think that it was hard but it it gave us what we needed. Yeah, so then the really big issue we had was team building. Normally when we were IRL and in a physical space, at the beginning right, uh, right before like playing the keynote trailer, we'd have like little, uh, we like play trivia and things just to get people loosened up, watch the keynote speakers. And then once we have the theme, we would have little design exercises to get people in groups talking about the theme, talking about games and just meeting each other. In a virtual format, we cannot do that. So originally we were gonna use Gather Town and then we didn't have budget for it. So then someone reached out to us and said, here, try this new platform we're trying, which is called here.fm. So if any of y'all were in the Boston <laughs> uh, Global Game Jam 2021, you know that it took exactly 30 seconds for this to fail. Um, yes. <laughs> This platform was, we were so excited. It was super cool. It's like Miro meets Zoom, Miro being an uh, online whiteboard site. It has like little uh, warp that you can do to go to different pages. So like not everyone has to be on the same page. It had whiteboarding and drawing and you could put stickers and all this stuff. You can see from the screenshot, like it looks pretty neat. And literally within 30 seconds, it was overwhelmed. People didn't know what was going on. Um, our internet ended up crashing. So we couldn't even like tell people what was going on. <laughs> Um, I remember just sitting in this and people were just resizing everything, adding things that they shouldn't have been. Someone said, how far can we push this program before it breaks? <laughs> Overall, it didn't work. Um, so we very quickly rushed back to Discord, making uh, some voice channels so people can just jump in there and chat. Um, it ended up kind of working when we let people just figure it out for themselves. Um, we had a pitches channel in Discord and then a pitch discussion and tried to moderate that. So people were only putting pitches in the pitch channel and only talking about them in pitch discussion. Um, luckily enough, uh, I think Greg, a local dev, tried to herd the cats into one Discord call and just be like, okay guys, like pitch your things here, make sure to put the finalized pitch in the channel and then we can you can find people who wanna talk about that later. Um, so, so thankful for being able to do that. Um, 
But yeah, even though we tried something new with Here FM and it didn't work, it almost kind of did because we weren't able to have that like ice breaking, like loosen people up activity. And even though it failed miserably, people were laughing and like had something to talk about. So at least it was slightly less awkward in that um, aspect. And yeah, running running Global Game Jam and Pandemic was really hard, but it somehow went really well. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. We had, we had actually a similar turnout to our in real life event, which was really impressive in my opinion. We thought that we were gonna have a lot less people since yeah. it was online, but it honestly, was about the same, if not even more. So really fun. If you guys ever want um, any more advice or any more horror stories so that this doesn't happen to you one day, feel free to reach out to either of us on Twitter and we are happy to help in any way. Thanks so much. Thanks for chatting with us. I'm not sure that any of us uh, here can at all empathize with the challenges of having technical difficulties. Um, but uh, we will we will do our best, and uh, at least you are an excellent resource and a great group of up and coming folks that people can talk with. And uh, if I am not mistaken, I believe this brings us to our last lightning talk of the evening. Indeed, it does. Uh, Steph Wu is going to tell us about why pie charts are garbage and how to use data to tell better stories than what we've been getting now. Uh, so let's see if we've got Steph set up here. Steph, can you hear us? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Fantastic. Yes, we can. Cool. Uh, unfortunately, I changed my topic a little bit, and that's just because uh, I realized that all of my reasons why pie charts are terrible doesn't fit in a 15 minute talk. Uh, so I have switched this a little bit. Uh, still going to be talking a little bit about data, but uh, can everyone see my screen? By everyone, Should I mean. Be Good. Yes. Uh, I mean, this is what lightning talks are for. Make it crazy. Go nuts. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about some data storytelling, which is definitely not the most exciting topic of all of the talks. So, uh, you know, ending this off is a little funky for me, but we're just going to roll with it. Uh, so hi, uh, I'm Steph. Uh, I am a product manager at Proletariat Inc, a local indie developer that has just recently reached medium size uh, in the Boston area. And previously I was a program manager at Microsoft working uh, for their consumer support fraud team. Uh, I do a lot of data analytics, a lot of data presenting and a lot of decision making. And I figured today I would come in here and try to convince you all that data is not as boring a topic as it comes across. Uh, in a lot of instances. So hopefully you'll stick with me and I can uh, both do that and then also uh, give you some ideas for how you can better convince people to do things by using data. Um, so uh, first off, I do wanna make a clarification about data analytics versus data storytelling. So uh, these are both things that I do on a daily basis in my job in which analytics is the act of querying data, looking at data, exploring all of it, trying to figure out what's going on, finding different cool things that you can present to people um, and, and uh, show them the cool things that are going on in both your game and also internally with your team or your company versus storytelling, which is the act of actually effectively communicating all of this data to people. Um, the purpose of storytelling here is really, really important and I think is the thing that gets overlooked and is what I'm talking about today in that not everyone is a data analyst and sometimes you just need to get people to understand the thing that you're saying so that you can act quickly and make a decision. Uh, and that sort of uh, gets bogged down really quickly when you don't know how to make the graph legible or show someone what's going on. Uh, so basically here, it's just imagine if you did an entire, uh, you know, you got a lot of data, you put it on Excel spreadsheet, and then you just handed someone the Excel spreadsheet and said like, okay, like, here you go, here's what I found, uh, go do something with it. Uh, this is sort of that transformation, that's the storytelling part, and is uh, what is in this image below. Uh, so why does this matter? Uh, and this is what I'm going to try to convince you today. So data insights, uh, whether it's from a professional data analyst, or it is just someone putting a couple of numbers in an Excel document, uh, they don't matter unless you can do something with them. Um, and the people making the decisions as to what you should do with this data are usually not data analysts. Um, and uh, yeah, they're usually not data analysts. And this includes a wide array of people. Uh, you want to get buy-in on something that you found. 
uh, internally from your company or in your game. And this doesn't just include like investors or higher ups. This isn't just sort of like, hey, here's how you can convince this investor to put money into your game. Um, or here's how you can convince your CEO to do this particular thing. But this also includes getting buy-in from your team. So even if you have like a five person team or a 100 person team, those teams will work more effectively if they care about the thing that they're working on and they understand why you're doing it. So a lot of this is also saying, oh, we are working on this feature. We are improving this part of the game. We're putting investment in this thing because of X, with X being the analysis on data that you did and getting your entire team to get on board and understand why you're doing it just makes everyone work a lot more efficiently, communicate better, et cetera. So uh, I'm going to now walk you through sort of my process in uh, my daily job on how I go from uh, taking in analysis, either that I found myself or given to me by one of our data analysts and presenting that to someone to try and make a decision on it. So for those of you who are not familiar with Spellbreak, uh, Spellbreak is a cross-platform battle mage battle royale game. And we have six classes that you pick before you go into the game. Uh, the six classes are listed here, but today we're actually going to be talking about just one of them, which is Stone Shaper. Uh, as the name assumes and uh, the icon assumes, Stone Shaper is our earthbender per se, if you're familiar with Avatar. They, uh, they work with the ground, they throw rocks, uh, they create fissures in the ground. Uh, they have a lot of ground area of effect attacks, and they also have a power that gives them extra armor, which makes them really great for new players because you don't need to know how to aim because of all of the area effect. And you're also really tanky. Uh, if you happen to come out of a battle and you're kind of low on armor, you can just regain it instead of having to find another way to do it. So we found that the success rates of new players are actually much higher with the Stone Shaper class because it requires a lot less precision and gaming background. So uh, here is an actual graph from our game from a, a particular period of time that shows class pick rates per, um, per platform and per class. And they're kind of color coded, uh, but the graph's still a little bit messy, but this is the kind of thing that we would get as the raw poll from our analysts. So on the bottom there, you can see the player level and then on the Y axis is the percent of player matches for which these classes were picked. And if you look really closely, uh, you can kind of pick out these two brown lines, which are the pick rates for Stone Shaper on console and for PC. Uh, last slide, you will remember that I said that Stone Shaper is really great for new players because they don't have to aim. But you'll also notice, according to this graph, that no new players are picking Stone Shaper. Uh, they're all going with other things until they get to about the intermediate level. And then they're suddenly realizing that Stone Shaper is really good, and they're all suddenly picking it. Um, so uh, now moving to the left with some of those bullet points, uh, when looking at this graph, I'm going to think to myself, OK, what is the big insight we're getting out of this? Uh, how can I pare this down to make it a good visual? And then will that visual I come out with back this up if I'm trying to convince someone that we need to do something about this? So we're looking at this and we're saying, OK, Stone Shaper, really easy for new players, not getting picked. Let's pare this down to make it easier for us to make that point to someone. So now I've just added that insight to the bottom so you can keep it in mind. So let's think about the visual here. Uh, what do we want to do with this? So first off, uh, we've got console and PC here, but they're about the same for both. None of these lines for Stone Shaper are really diverging. So uh, let's just simplify this. Uh, let's put them together. We don't need the console PC split. Cool. You can see that Stone Shaper line still doing that rise and fall. Awesome, it's still showing the same thing that we wanna show. Uh, now let's think about some other options for how we can show this better because there's still a decent amount of noise in this graph and it doesn't really speak for itself. So I've put a couple options up here, the top left being the original one. Uh, you know, that one does a pretty decent job. The one below it kind of shows that the percentage does go up as it goes on, but it doesn't really show how, how big the difference is between new players and intermediate players. Uh, on the upper right, I actually bucketed our players who are levels 1 through 10 and our players who are 11 plus. And you can kind of see the change there. It still doesn't look very dramatic, but we're getting somewhere. And on the bottom right, uh, in order to adhere to my original talk theme, uh, here's a pie chart that does a very bad job of showing this. It is completely illegible and is a default sometimes for a lot of people. Um, if you've ever seen a pie chart like this uh, and suffered on a slide, um, yeah, there, there it is for you. It was obligatory. I put it there. Uh, it's really not great. All of these slices look the same. The colors are completely legible. We're not going to go with that. 
Um, so in the end, I ended up landing on that two bucket thing, but keeping the line graph. So, and then I kind of dimmed out the colors of the other classes that we don't care about. So now you can see, uh, we've got this graph here that's just like, hey, beginner players, not really picking Stone Shaper. Intermediate players, they're really picking Stone Shaper. Boom, there we go, there's our graph. So now we say, okay, what can we do with this graph? We need to make a decision. We need to make some sort of action. And if we make an action, we make a decision, can we point back to this graph and have it sort of speak for itself to explain why we did that thing? Uh, so lucky for me, I'm also being a product manager, uh, the way we have things at Proletariat, I also get to somewhat make decisions on what we do with this information. So this isn't an, actually a scenario that happened, but here are some of the things that I would possibly recommend we do with this spell rate class. So number one saying, okay, we want to increase the pick rate of Stone Shaper for our new players. Let's require them to play Stone Shaper as their first class. Let's lock them to Stone Shaper. They can't play anything else until they played five matches of Stone Shaper. So that's one idea. Uh, another one is that, oh man, Stone Shaper's art is all brown. Nobody wants to play the brown class. So maybe we could increase the flashiness of the Stone Shaper. Let's do that. Like let's uh, change the color. Let's change the branding. Let's get players excited about playing the Earthbender. Uh, so that's the second option. Or the third one, if you wanted to go more of a marketing sort of aim, uh, let's run a marketing push with influencers playing Stone Shaper to bring in new players so that their first exposure to the game is Stone Shaper and they're more inclined to go in and play it as their first class. So there immediately are three potential decisions that we can make with this. And all three of them, if we say, if someone comes to you and says, okay, uh, but why did you do that? We can then point at this graph and say, well, you can see, Early players weren't picking it, intermediate players were, and we wanted to level that playing field a little bit. So uh, so here's just a sort of quick in conclusion. Here's what we started with. Has a lot of good information in it, but pretty messy, not all that easy to read if you were to point someone at it and our end result that pretty much speaks for itself. And we can just throw it in a document or throw it somewhere and refer back to it anytime someone asks us about a decision. Uh, I hope that wasn't too dull for people. I know it's not nearly as exciting as looking at Unity or talking about game jams, but uh, I think it's pretty important talking about graphs information uh, and can apply to pretty much any game situation. So uh, thanks everyone. And uh, my contact info is at the bottom left if you wanna talk about memes and games, my two biggest interests. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. The, uh, the older I get, the more I appreciate good data visualizations. So, uh, that's very real. Thank you. Uh, all right, everybody. Thank you so, so, so much for coming out. Uh, thanks for bearing with us through our initial technical difficulties. Uh, we've learned some great lessons, and maybe we'll turn them into a talk at some point. Uh, in any event, we really appreciate all of you, and we hope that we will not wait nearly so long next time before we actually see each other again. On behalf of, uh, of, of Gavin and Chris, who are not on screen right now because uh, technology is difficult, I just wanted to say that uh, we will be reaching out uh, uh, as soon as we have our next event set up. In the meantime, do please go check out the other Boston game dev stuff that's going on, uh, including that upcoming Boston Unity uh, uh event and uh, if you have any any questions or any ideas for us about things that you would like to see or any of the folks who were here who have not shared their contact with you uh, hit us up and we will make that happen so I'm gonna wait and see if uh, if Chris or Gavin wants to say anything else that I can communicate for them like a giant talking meat puppet I'm seeing nothing I think we're good. All right. Thank you all once again. We hope you have a good night and we'll talk to you soon.